welcome everybody to speak up. We're really pleased that you can all be here. We may have people drifting in, and I think we have quite a few people on the phone. We're hoping that WebEx cooperates with us. It's my great pleasure to introduce Lily Jack, who is a professor of economics at Georgetown University and a co director of DIVE, which I've achieved and see. It's the Georgetown University on Innovative Innovation Development and Evaluation. Since um, the first paper that um, and Kathy Suri did on risk sharing and transactions costs um, in, on, in Kenya came out in 2014. Um, we've been eagerly anticipating follow-up work on that. Now it's come out, and I think you've all had the chance to read the recent article um, in Science um, on benefits that we're starting to see coming out of people being kind of networked close to agents um, in Kenya, and that that's having actually measurable benefits on people's lives. And so he's here to talk with us about that today. Um, so I think the way we're going to work this is you're going to talk for maybe 20 minutes okay, and just share the results of the findings and then we'll really open it up for questions and we want this to be sort of an informal exchange of ideas. Over to you. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, inviting me to, to present today and thanks everyone for coming and for dialing in. Um, thanks also to whoever found a picture of me that's eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> it made me feel good. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so uh, it's a uh, delight to be here with you today. Um, I, you can yeah. Yeah. I haven't started speaking yet. good if you I want to first uh, recognize and recognize uh, the contributions of my fellow at Tabney Street to this work. Uh, Tabney, uh, anybody, for those of you who know her, she's a powerhouse, and uh, both personally and also econometrically and empirically and everything. Uh, so she's in the, the driver of most of this, uh, and I, I couldn't have been anywhere near it without her. Um, also, I just want to, although the screen doesn't quite give us full Rich, but uh, this is what Greta was referring to, that she was able to say, oh, uh, Georgetown University, this is one innovation, development, and evaluation. Uh, a research group at Georgetown that conducts this kind of work uh, around the uh, world. Uh, I have to say that most of the work for this project, which has been going on now for seven or eight years, uh, has been implemented through uh, IPA in, in um, So, I am going to click, so it's a little bit less smooth. <laughs> so, everyone knows about mobile money. I don't have to spend any time telling you that this is a pretty impressive thing. Uh, economists like these days, you know, to get published anyway, you have to make something terribly uh, opaque and uh, tricky for anyone to understand, except, you know, with an advanced degree from some organization. Uh, but uh, basically, there's demand and supply. Uh, what economists work with, and both of these things worked in tandem in Kenya to produce uh, the success that MPASA has been. On the demand side, people wanted this thing. There was a need that was unrealized or unmet, uh, and that was basically driven by the fact that people, families lived uh, in geographically uh, dispersed areas across Kenya. There was a need for sending money around, and there wasn't the infrastructure to do so at the time uh, that M-Pesa was launched in 2007. And on the supply side, you know, the uh, Safaricom did a good job in addressing that need, both with an aging network that grew uh, very rapidly, widely, it <coughs> uh, reached not just a few people, but everywhere across the country, and the central bank allowed it to happen. Effectively. There was some regulatory largesse that allowed this experiment effectively uh, to proceed. And so with those factors, we saw uh, rapidly a, a, a rapid adoption of this technology, probably the, the most uh, rapid adoption of any technology in history, perhaps, with Kevin and I have uh, in an earlier paper, we've got a picture that we you know, stole from someone uh, of the adoption of 
like you know washing machines and hair dryers or whatever. And all of these things have been adopted relatively quickly. But when you put them on the same graph as mobile money, mobile money looks vertical. Uh, it's so quick the adoption of this thing. Uh, initially, you know, it was all about mobile, uh, banking for the poor. That wasn't the case initially. The first people to adopt this thing were the rich people, <laughs> like most. Uh, technologies, uh, richer people uh, adopted. But by 2014, uh, virtually everyone in Kenya has, every household has access to uh, mobile money. And the poorest quartile uh, caught up with the rest of the population by 2014. Um, men and women are also pretty evenly matched, so this is male and female headed households again. This is from our survey data, by the way, not. Um, and so by 2014, also over 90% of households have access to mobile money, and 90, 98% of male-headed households, 2% of female-headed households. And over time, you know, the female-headed households have lagged behind a little bit, but not too much. Uh, there's no huge gender gap here in terms of adoption. If people could mute their phones, please. We're getting a lot of noise on the line. Thank you. If that baby starts crying again, I'll have a Donald Trump moment. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I told you I promise never to have a Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's been widespread adoption of this thing. Yeah, I have a, a slide in a longer presentation that shows the number of number of households, the number of people in the U.S. that drink uh, carbonated soft drinks, which is also very large. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I suspect it's a bad thing. But uh, just the fact that this thing has been adopted is not evidence that we should be interested in it, certainly from a public policy point of view. Uh, it means that people are willing to pay for it, uh, but it doesn't mean that there's any role for government or institutions like CGAP to be interested. So uh, why might it matter? Uh, it might make us richer. That would be great. Uh, and it might make us safer. And so the work that I'll just very quickly review today says that both of these things seem to be true. Um, and how does it make us richer? Well, if you want to talk about growth or some kind of efficient allocation of stuff, there might be some capital accumulation that uh, is facilitated by mobile money, savings, or there might be some allocative efficiencies that are exploited because of this technology. And we'll look at some labor allocation uh, effects in our work. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go through any kind of, you know, this is not, even not a seminar with tables and all that kind of jazz. Right? Uh, this is just the story. But why is it so hard to tell? So the first thing you would think of doing would be to, be to look at people who had M-Pesa and people who didn't and see what the difference was. Okay. But well, the first problem is that now there are none of these guys left. <laughs> okay, so that's a problem. And so but even if we could find people without it, the, um, the people with mobile money tend to be more educated. They tend to uh, have a bank account already, which is, so that would be uh, proving their lives. They tend to live in cities. Um, either they live in the nice part of town or the not so nice part of town, in Kibera or Maputo or somewhere like that. But still, they're in cities. And, and all of this means that they're generally richer. On the other hand, the people in, uh, who don't have it tend to not have those uh, you know, education and, uh, and uh, banking services, financial services. They tend to be you know, in rural areas, and so they tend to be relatively poor. So if I was just to compare these guys, it wouldn't tell me much about the impact of them. <laughs> and so we had to search hard, or at least not so much search hard, but do a lot of work in collecting data that would allow us to somehow ex uh, control for all of these differences that exist between users and non-users of MPESA and look for some so-called exogenous variation that would allow us to make a causal inference about the impact of MPESA. So, uh, as I said, you'll notice that when I said you know, that the Impesa was a big success because of some supply side factors, I didn't say anything about the fact that there were some smart computer coders you know, writing the code for the for, the, for Impesa. That's true, they were, but that 
was hardly the reason for a success. Right? We always had, hold the phone and say, this is what mobile money is, and this is the solution. And it's true. We couldn't have done it without mobile money. But really, the reason that mobile money, one of the primary reasons mobile money was successful was that Safaricom deployed and managed an efficient cash management system called the agent network. Right? And it's, that's all about you know, the nuts and bolts of delivery of stuff, of, of money. And so we were able in our, in our survey, so we did a survey of households across Kenya, uh, virtually all of Kenya represented this of the country, and at the same time we collected, or subsequently we collected information about uh, the mobile money agents. And we asked, when did you start uh, your activities as a mobile money agent? Based on that, we could draw a map of the evolution of the agent network. Okay, so this is where those light blue dots there are, are that the locations of agents, not all agents, but in the areas in which we were doing our survey, when that was a random selection of areas, uh, we, we found out how many of uh, where the agents were. This is in June 2007, so the agents that had been established in or before 2000, June 2007, okay? And I'll just go through a few clicks to show you how this agent network grew. They get denser and denser and denser, as we'll see, up to June 2010. That's where we finished. So we, we did this survey of agents in June 2010 and asked them when they started. So we had to do all this, uh, this map. Now, that looks like a bit of a salt and pepper kind of shaking of agents all over the job. And that's true, and that's why we can say something about the impact of a test. So it looks like it's a random allocation of agents. There's no reason for you to believe that, except that we've been able to show it in our data. Okay? So <coughs> it turns out that this agent rollout gives us a bit of a quasi-experiment. Okay? So the early expansion, by early I mean between 2007 and 2010, the expansion of the agent network, it wasn't like they really rolled the dice and, and put agents or, you know, randomly out there. But we find no correlation between the characteristics of the households we talk to and how far they are for an agent or how the agent network was building up around them. So there were poor people who had agents building up around them. There were rich people who had agents building up around them. There were uh, you know, educated people and uneducated people. It, didn't, it wasn't the fact that the agents just went to rich households. Now, they were relatively more represented in, in rich places, but within those places, like, you know, areas, there was random, more or less, random, there was no correlation between the kinds of uh, uh, households that they were near to. So, what that means is that, so, MPESA launches in 2007, and between 2007 and uh, 2010, there's as good as random uh, expansion of the agent network. And that random word, boy, when one of us guys sees random, we just get too excited. Yeah? <laughs> and, we call it, and we color it a different color, and we say, maybe I can say something now. Right? So it's as if there was a roll of the dice in terms of the uh, um, deployment of this agent network. What that means is that people who were close to agents, not people who actually had the present, but people who were close to agents, were effectively randomly selected from the population. And people who weren't so close to agents were effectively random as well. So we can kind of separate our, our population, our households that we went and spoke to, and we spoke to like 3,000 of them, although there was attrition, of course, over time. Uh, but we get these two groups of households, people that saw large growth in access to the MPESA agents and people who saw relatively small or zero growth. And so by comparing those two groups, we can possibly say something about the impact of MPESA. And if we compare those two groups, looking at data that we collected up until 2010, we get you know, short-term impacts. And the more recent work is using data from 2014. And we get uh, the longer-term impact of MPESA. Now, I've got to say that the agent network grew kept on growing after 2010, but the way in which it grew then appeared to be less, was more correlated with household characteristics. So why did that happen? So a few things. One thing is 
that early on there was so much demand from from people to be agents that Safari Farm had trouble just managing them, and they would just say, "Yeah, fine, go and be an agent." <laughs> uh, there was, I mean, they were they were careful in the way they managed these agents and the contractual arrangements they had and all of that kind of stuff. But their location wasn't there wasn't a master plan really behind that deployment. Second reason is that, and, but then you know later on they kind of got their act together in some sense and were more uh, uh, deliberate in the way that agents were deployed. The second thing is that you know in I can't remember it was it 2011 there was the, the agent banking uh, regulations were passed that allowed competitors to start being like Safari Cup, like equity banks, <laughs> and so there's a lot of competition now and the growth of alternative. Uh, financial access points, that, and that was not grand, right? The, you know, the equity was in fact very to where the safari company was, or at least the, the, the profitable safari company uh, markets were, et cetera. So there was stuff happened after 2010 that was not rampant, but we don't use that growth in our analysis. Right. So let me just tell you the, 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 what happened. Uh, so this is from the earlier work that many of you might have done. Uh, so when times get bad, what happens? So you know, when times get bad, or well, things are bad, and in particular for people who, you can think of these red guys as people without M-Pesa. In fact, they're people who don't see a large growth in access to M-Pesa agents. Uh, they see consumption for the capital consumption by about seven percent for those guys. On the other hand, if you if you have better access to uh, M-Pesa agents then typically your consumption goes up by about 4 or 5 percent. Now, the difference in all of these graphs, the difference between those two numbers is going to be statistically significant. Okay? And so we get something like you know, 12 percentage points difference between per capita uh, uh, consumption level in response to a shock. So if this is conditional on something bad happening, if you don't have MPESA, then your household is hurt. If you do, your household is at least maintained in terms of per capita consumption, maybe increased a bit. But the difference is certainly significant. Um, how does that happen? Well, you know, remittances, internal remittances are an important uh, you know, uh, means of support across Kenya and other developing countries. I don't need to tell you guys that. Uh, and the, what happens when times go bad is that people without remittances are less likely to get a remittance. Uh, sorry, people without MPESA are less likely to go to remittance. You know, when times go bad, that's when you need one. <laughs> but so why would the chance of a remittance go down? Well, it could be that the people you're getting remittances from are suffering the same problem that you're suffering. Right? So, and that that speaks to the idea that without MPESA, without this technology for transferring money over long distances, you, your source of remittances is relatively nearby you. So you know, when it hails on your farm, it hails on your next door neighbor's farm as well. And so the supply of remittances may well uh, be uh, restricted. On the other hand, if you've got MPESA, the chance of having a remittance actually goes up. And that's what you want to see with, uh, when, when things get bad. You want the remittances to respond to them, and, and they do if you're connected like this. So that's the chance of getting a remittance. And then the number of people sending your remittances also changes. So you know, people with and without MPESA have have some people sending them remittances over time. When things go bad, these guys dry up. Fewer of them send remittances, or at least someone who's not connected with M-Pesa gets remittances from fewer people, whereas the network expands for people with M-Pesa. We've got another result that says the distance a remittance travels is higher if you're an M-Pesa user in response to a sign. And that's consistent with all of this, that you're able to draw on a, a larger and a more diverse and more geographically more widespread network. All of this is completely obvious, you would say. Right? Of course that's what's going to happen. But, you know, interestingly, we could actually measure it and not just kind of say it and hope it's true. Okay. So we that was in terms of general consumption, like consumption, per capita consumption across all types of goods. We also looked specifically at health risks and the response uh, to those. So when, uh, when you have a health risk, so these other risks could be like losing a job and uh, that kind of thing, but uh, in response to a health risk, you know, people without MPESA, they spend more on medical care when they get sick. No kidding, right? 
people with MPEG suspect a bit more. So there's not too much going on there, but what's going on is that the guys without MPEG, they finance that expenditure by cutting back on other stuff. So non-food expenses go down, whereas for MPEG users go up, and food expenses also go down a bit for non-users, but for MPEG users they go up. So MPEG users are protected against the financial risk of having to pay for them. So I've only got two <coughs> slides on the long-term impact. Oh, with scientists, they make you write these four-page articles, right? It's got just like three years per page. <laughs> 400 regressions per page, I think. Uh, but I, we can capture the, the, the punchline in one of these pictures. So remember I said that the long-term impacts are looking at uh, data from 2014. And so we looked at the growth in consumption between 2008 and 2014, six year period uh, per household consumption. Uh, again, kind of comparing these two groups, the groups that saw a large early expansion in the investment, groups that saw uh, less of it in the So this first picture, <coughs> I'm sorry, my, my color scheme is, I'm, I messed with you a bit here because now the red line is not the red guys. It's <laughs> the green guys. Uh, um, so the red line is, the, think of those as households with MPESA. They're the households that saw a relatively large increase in access to agents over, this, over the first uh, two years, 2000, two or three years, until 2010. The black line is households that didn't see much of a change in access to MPESA. Okay. And this picture is just for male headed households. So we've got a sample, and we cut it in half male, and not half, sorry. We, we've got female-headed and male-headed, and amongst male-headed households, we look at those who effectively had access to so a big increase in access to a person and people did. And we ask, how did consumption change over there? So this is change in log consumption, so think of percentage change in consumption. So if the sample went up, the sample went down, there's not too much difference between the distribution of those changes across the male-headed households. Those with MPESA or with better access to MPESA so some went up, some went down, and those without access to MPESA, some went up, some went down. It wasn't much of a difference. Okay. On the other hand, if we look at females, well, if the first uh, kind of thing you'll draw from this is uh, they look about the same. But that's where you know, actually doing, doing some calculations uh, can be helpful. It turns out that down the bottom here, there's an important shift in these distributions. So. <coughs> Remember, the red line is the people with MPESA or better access to MPESA. The black line is the ones without. So it's especially important. That, so there's a couple of things going on here. First, this difference is it only shows up for female-headed households. And second, it only shows up at the bottom. Right? At the top of these distributions, the top half of these two distributions, they're more or less on, uh, on top of each other. That's a, that's a technical term, so <laughs> more or less on top of each other. Uh, but at the bottom, there seems to be this difference, and we can you know, do some tests to show that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on at the bottom that says, if anything, MPESA has allowed households, female headed households, to avoid falls in consumption, as opposed to you know, actually making them uh, see a positive increase in consumption. But it has stopped them from getting poor. So, uh, we estimate now if we, if we take our sample, we use those coefficients and scale it up to the population in the rural areas, et cetera. And so I should have said this, all of this work is, this uh, longer term impact is for only rural areas, not the Nairobi sample. So this is uh, about the countryside. So we, we estimate, you know, if this is, if these parameters are representative of the country, and they are because of the way we sampled, then we think that roughly 186,000 uh, households moved out of extreme poverty uh, during this period associated with or because of the expansion of the action network. So how did that happen? So it turns out that we see an impact on savings. So we ask in our survey to ask and they and it turns out that those female headed households do save we see a move out of agriculture and into business 
Now, business is not Trump Tower type of business, right? It's, it's selling stuff on the side, you know, the, uh, little stalls or whatever. And it's hard for us to say exactly what's going on here. We, in these surveys, you're not going to really find out exactly what people think. There's a list of potential things they're doing, and, but you know they're characterised as being either farming or business or, or working for the government or self-employment or something like this. Uh, and there seems to be this move into into business as well, which is probably sometimes um, this is. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, hang my hat on this, but there is also it appears to be a reduction in household size associated with uh, fewer children at home. Now, that could be that fewer children are being born. I doubt that very much. So it would that'd be strange to see a fertility effect over this short period, maybe. Uh, but, but there could be some influence, impact on schooling. So maybe kids are going away to school, etc. So uh, if that's the case, you know, if there's more education coming out of this, then that's a, that's a pretty good thing. Although we, we can't really tell for sure what's going on. But, so remember I said, you know, how, how would it make it richer, either capital accumulation or labor allocation? Well, maybe there is some capital accumulation. I'm talking really micro stuff here, right? So maybe this woman can, can, can save an extra thousand or two thousand uh, shillings or something. That's enough to get a, to buy enough potatoes to be worth taking to market, whatever it is. And there's labor allocation as well, that, that changes the thing they do. Uh, because of access to prison. Now, why this would happen is another question. Uh, yeah, I don't, we, there is so much we don't know about what's going on. Uh, why would having access to Impressor mean that it was now profitable for you to start selling things on the, in the market instead of just working on it? I yeah, we can tell stories about that, I'm sure. Uh, but that's a, a question we should uh, address. So, just to summarize, uh, that should be short and long-term impacts of this. So it comes to the consumption of female-headed households increases. Oh, so this is just this is just the long term. Uh, poverty levels seem to go down. Again, if we scale up our, you know, use our parameters to, to scale up the population, about 186,000 households move out of poverty. Extreme poverty. This is, extreme poverty is like one dollar, dollar twenty-five. Right? So it's really poor. Um, Women move out of farming into business. Uh, the coefficients are small, but again, when you apply them to the population, you get you know, a quarter of a million people who are now doing something different to what they were doing before. And, um, and you know, it's not trivial. Okay, so last slide is um, so so what? Uh, mobile money as we've kind of Conceptualized it is only a transactional uh, service. It just allows you to send money. Uh, we haven't put in here entry or any of the attempts at insurance or anything like that. Um, although they were entry was certainly happening, but we didn't uh, you know, focus on that as a as a uh, uh, an intervention itself. But maybe is there any sense in which you know if mobile money can do this? when it just provides this transactional service. <laughs> Could we then go to the microfinance literature, which has been underwhelming, <laughs> maybe, at best, and say, maybe, you know, microfinance has to be good, you would think. You know, giving people credit, in the, the right people credit, or in the right way, whatever, then, you know, that's got to be a good thing. And the fact that it hasn't had these big effects is, is puzzling. Is it just simply that we we weren't giving it to them the right way? Again, it's a really kind of kind of boring question about how I deliver finance to someone. Uh, is, is that going to maybe if I deliver it through the a mobile phone, is that going to be more effective? I, I don't know. Uh, and in a sense, it's not really worth doing an experiment because who in their right mind would be reduced cash anymore? Right? You know, mobile phone seems so much more uh, effective, but you know, that's an open question. Can, uh, can mobile technology kind of improve the functioning of these financial services more generally, uh, and, and not just from a transactional point of view? Okay, so uh, as I said, this is where I live, and um, I'm happy to chat. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions. If you
Harrison Harris already got his hand up, and then okay. Oh, wow, that's a hard <laughs> So let's start with Harrison, and then we'll work our way around the room. Really, thank you. Great. I mean, uh, okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here comes the question. Uh, we, uh, I've got two questions. So one is, uh, one more remark about microfinance and credit services. I mean, is there any way in which some of the results could point towards lowering costs to customers to engage with providers and lowering costs to providers to engage with customers? So that's one observation, because that will link to your final question. And then my first question is, it seems somehow to me, if I look at this, that Impesa can be seen as a broadening of the social network of poor people. And, and, and would you look at the network effects here in terms of, at the moment, if I don't have Impesa, I'm locked into a very small social network, so in terms of money sent, money received, uh, sort of reciprocal of evasions and all of that's pretty small. And suddenly Impesa opens it up and your cousin from seven provinces away can actually send your money, your network goes open. Just two remarks about that would be interesting. Thanks. Sure. So, um, this always happens, right? The first time, are the cost. Yeah. Let me talk about the network first. So, absolutely, I, I mean, so here's a question. Does Mpesa actually change the identity or increase the number of people in your network? I'm not sure about that but I think it gives you access to them, right? So, yeah, I've got a friend of my, my, my daughter who lives down in Kilifi somewhere. I know she's there, but, you know, by the time she gets on a matatu and brings up 20, 000, you know, 2,000 shillings, half of which gets stolen, uh, it's going to be too late. So uh, I think Mpesa is giving you access to your network. Uh, whether it increases the size of your network, that's... I, I, actually, I know it does, but you know, maybe detrimental effect because people say oh, no, everyone's calling me for money. But so uh, people I didn't know who were in my network appear to be in my network now. So you know, that, that could be a, another dimension. Uh, but absolutely, this is all about communication, right? It's all about networks, links between people. Uh, I think those links are kind of complicated sometimes. And, you know, ethnograph, ethnographers, and, and sociologists have have looked a lot about the kinds of people who are in these networks, and maybe if the way if Mpesa changes the kinds of people who are, uh, you know, active, um, and that could have meaningful effects on the way the network operates. But yeah, I think to a first approximation, you're exactly right. In terms of the cost, absolutely. So, you know, I've always wondered. The women in microfinance organizations really like getting together every week to, to, to deliver you know, 50 cents of repayment. Maybe they do, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I like getting together. <laughs> so I showed up today. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, maybe this is a good way to allow them to take part in that. You know, it's potentially much more verifiable, too, if you use a mobile device than if you use cash. Uh, it could be a, a much more transparent. And if you had the right app, and if everyone had a smartphone. Yeah. So your hand is up, and then we have a whole series. Yeah. Thanks so much for your presentation. I come from Kenya, and Western Kenya, the rural where my project is. Uh, MPSA is not only for the poor, but it has really helped because my mother used to go and get money from Western Union, and people beat her, they steal her money. But now with M-Pesa, you just have a PIN number with the phone. Nobody knows what it is holding on the PIN number. So my mother asked the children, do we have something on the, the cell phone? They know. So it has brought a lot of security. And that security, this shows that the rural area also can be advanced on M-Pesa training and other things for them to grow up. And that's why I'm doing manufacturing in the rural area, focusing on agriculture. And I think, well, they listen, they want m -Pesa, There was no research on m -Pesa, So just using the m -Pesa, I think the rural areas are advancing slowly, slowly using it so they can still learn and make m -Pesa and cell phones more productive than just receiving the money because not all of them get the money. So I think uh, m -Pesa is... Uh, a very good way of getting money and then looking at WebSend, which is the American technology now where we send money from here 
many people with money now is as safe as MPESA. So I think uh, the technology is coming and it can be used more than just receiving. And the people have to be, have to be told not only receiving their money, they have to do something productive using the MPESA money. So I think your presentation is good and we have to make it better ourselves over there. We need to get your mama. This gentleman has his hand up. Um, two very short questions. How did you identify the 3,000 people you uh, you interviewed? What what lists are okay? And the second question, which is sort of the other end of the operation, what are the implications of your findings for the creation of competing networks within PISA? Okay, so uh, we went to the Canada National Bureau of Statistics, uh, and they have a sample frame. And we, at, no, it's a long time ago now. So we, we identified sublocations, we randomly selected sublocations based on population, et cetera. We, we oversampled in areas where we, we had information that there were more uh, impressive agents in some places. So we oversampled statistically in those places because in 2007 or early eight, we didn't know if we'd find anyone that was using impressive. And that was it. anyway. Uh, but yeah, we did it, uh, and we we didn't. We left out uh, the far north, so it was too far to go to get three people. Uh, but other than that, we were representative of the, the country. What's the implication for you know, competition, etc.? So, so this is where I'd like to, in some sense, go back to my you know my game theory past and my industrial organization kind of economics and say, what does this tell about competition and regulation and all, all that kind of stuff, right? Because there's, there's certain, you know, these, these are, there's certain fixed costs associated with these industries, the towers, right? The network, the agent network itself. And so you've got, now there's some interoperability, not really, Canada there is, uh, but in there's some kind of, at least the agents uh, can work for more than one uh, provider now. Um, I think that's a, a really important question. It could actually be a question that, you know, if we answer it correctly, will then allow us to see an answer at the beginning of what really was, you know, a, a major achievement. And if we don't, we might find that Impressor was a good example of what to do early on, but then other countries, you know, <coughs> leapfrog it if they get this competition and uh, regulation issue. Uh, Better addressed, but uh, that's not a real answer, right? But it's just—it's kind of an answer saying, "Yes, I agree. We should talk about that." <laughs> so I'm going to go to Michelle, and then we're going to take a question on the phone next. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, question on the, the methodology, and throughout it, you are using obviously access to agents as a proxy for use of MPSA, and it reads like an instrumental variable that you're using that in place of it. Uh, did you? Why didn't you take that next step and, and tie the association to actual use of MPSA? And do you have any <coughs> thoughts about how we should be interpreting the results in terms of the implications for access versus the implications of actual use? Right. So, yeah, we we actually were careful not to do well. Careful. We decided not to do the the full IV mm -hmm. and then you know, get a TOT type of estimate. Uh, I think people get kind of nervous about finding estimates that say, look, you the TAT estimate is like 100 percent. So if we, if we eliminated poverty amongst people who actually adopted MPESA, that seems a bit unrealistic. So uh, the, we wanted to err on the side of caution in, in some sense, right? Instead of overestimate, or over the estimate would have been the estimate, uh, but in terms of over kind of reporting the impact of this thing, and that's all. Yeah. Um, what was the well, and so how, how should we think about the results in terms of what does this indicate as far as is this an issue of access to agents and therefore a network should expand, or is this an issue of actual use of the product and how do you use So I think one, one way to think about it is, you know, if you have a person on your phone and no agent, if there's no agent, then it's useless. So at least it was. In the long term, hopefully that we won't need any agents at all, right? Because we'll just have electronic money. Uh, so, but it's, it's certainly still now, and throughout the top period, and it's is only really useful if you have access to access to it. So we could call this all a study of agent access, and, and the access to the agent is like think of it this way: there's, there's two inputs to impression. One is the phone, the other is the agent. Everyone's got the phone. 
right? And so there's no variation there. There's no policy there that, oh, we should give people phones and nothing like that. Uh, so the policy implications are more along the lines of how do we get access, financial access, you know, that's what we all talk about. So we're going to take a couple of questions from the phone. Um, so Matthew, who is participating online, says, I understood from the science article that the sample from Nairobi was dropped after 2011 due to high attrition, which means they're excluded from the long-term impact analysis. Do you have any estimates on the share of MPESA transfers among your sample that originated from Nairobi? And how do you think that the long-term impact estimates on poverty reduction and consumption would differ if Nairobi were included? Okay, so our rural samples, it's not that we, we don't drop people in the rural area who have a transaction with Nairobi, of course, right? So everyone's, everyone in the rural sample is there, the ones we could find. So they may well be interacting with people in Nairobi and, and surely they are a lot of the time. I can't tell you off the top of my head how many of them reported having a, tra a transaction with someone in Nairobi. Um, what would be, effectively, what's the long-term impact on people who live in Nairobi? I, I, can't, I can't say, um, because we don't have the data. Uh, you know, maybe it's smaller, if this geography thing is important. I, I'm kind of guessing it is. Uh, yeah. So, Nancy, do you want to do another one from the phone? Um, there are a couple of questions regarding the, the use of uh, agent network density as a proxy for mobile money adoption and usage. Uh, a few of the participants are asking if you can explain that a little bit more. Um, would I answer? I think I have an answer to be on top of Michelle's answer and the question. In my humble eyes, I think there are good news in your research and bad news. But I think the, uh, the good news is that the bad news makes your research way more powerful and the implications global. So there's only good news and good news. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, so that you, 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 you might want to agree, that's why I'm here. I agree already. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, because, uh, I mean, uh, building on this idea of taking the density of agents as a proxy to the use, I think that's a stretch. I think you're not measuring really M-Pesa uh, as, a, as a tool with all its functions, but you, you're measuring the, the impact of the proximity of access points to the users. So uh, if, if we take it as, as true for a moment, I think uh, you could take these implications uh, to a broader scale, because in, in many countries, in Latin America, Southeast Asia, the innovation of proximity of access points has occurred, but not in a mobile money manner. What, what does this mean? That you go to Colombia, for example, and you have had, or Brazil, let's say Brazil, which is a huge example. You have 300,000 uh, agents in Brazil. This is huge. Actually, this is the, uh, you, you can say that Brazil invented the idea of proximity of access points through agents. So uh, when you go there, you have the access point, but you have no mobile money at all. The, 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 the concept is, is not, but people can go to these access points, which is very proximate, very near to them, and they can transact. So I would assume that the same effect that you have found in Kenya would be in some way applicable to Brazil because the, 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 the measure that you, the variable that you have measured, which is proximity of access points or density of access points, is still there in Brazil. So if, if we take this for a moment, your implication I think could be very global in the sense that it could be applied to a lot of places where there's no mobile money because you're not measuring mobile, you're, you're, you're measuring access point proximity. And just last thing, in circles, in financial inclusion circles, we talk a lot about how to measure the impact of financial inclusion. So I think on that side, uh, your research is very interesting because it, it to a lot of us, uh, wraps in the right place in the sense that we are a lot about counting accounts. Mm -hmm. And counting accounts has a lot of problems. It's good to have that. But we, we might want to uh, have some other variables to measure the impact. And in my eyes, proximity is probably, uh, I mean, it's a stretch of my side, but it's, I think it's the variable to be measured now that we're not measuring right now as an, as an impact of financial inclusion the other way around. So uh, those are the good news and the bad news in the middle. So I hope what's your... So I think, I, I, I do think mobile money is important. If all these Safaricom agents had gone out there and no one had a phone, 
and I hope we will see no impact. No. Right? What am I going to do with that? There has to be something. As I said, there's two inputs. There's the phone and there's the agent. Now, I've got to go to the bank. Now, if I'm just using this as a bank account to put my money in and take it out, then that's fine. But if I'm using it to send money to my mom on the other side of the country, I need the phone. All right. That's, that's, that's not stem from the data. What you're measuring is proximity of access point. You're not measuring housing. Mm. Complementary inputs to this production function, which is producing the ability to send money a long way. I have to have a phone and I have to be able to get money into my phone. The way I do that is that an agent. And if people who are close to agents are better able to do that. That's all. If I'm close to an agent but I don't have a phone or there's no such thing as more money, then it's not clear that I'm going to be able to send money to my phone. Now, it could be that this is a bank and they're you know, very efficient in the bank transfers and things. So that's the same thing. Right? So I, I, it'd be interesting in Brazil, like, if mobile money doesn't exist, what are these agents do? Are they just a place to deposit money? They're sending money to the mother. Right, they, they are sending money. So it's kind of I'm going to go to the lady in the corner. Yeah. Hi. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I, I didn't read the paper, but so if it's covered there, the questions covered there, I'm sorry. Um, so did you also, in their measure, people, do they get their salaries or payment or other or paid school fees or that type of thing through mobile money? Um, and in which case um, did we see a lot, like this lady talked about, about um, there's a lot of instances of people going to the bank and bank says, oh, your money's not here yet. Come back another day. Or your money, or this money was only this amount. Or, or some other excuses, or what, what she talks about, you're not getting paid at the right time, at the right place, and the amount you expect, and then also can get sold along the way. And what do you see about the salary payments of the employees who may not have had bank accounts in okay. the places, and, and, and how that impacts them to the whole So we don't have the Afghanistan story, right? Everyone thought they got a pay rise uh, because of mobile money. Um, I'm sure that some people in the data get paid by M-Pesa. For instance, you know, the, the, the Ascari that I used to have standing outside my house in Nairobi when I lived there, he got paid by mobile money. <laughs> um, but we, we're not able to say that this many people got paid this way, and that was particularly important in generating this effect. I don't think it is, because most of the people that are affected seem to be pretty poor. They're unlikely to have salary jobs. Um, uh, you. You did mention one thing that I think is important, like knowing how much you got. Again, this is, this is where the phone is really important. When I send money to my mum, she gets a text immediately saying that really sent money to you. And I get a text saying, or some kind of thing on my phone saying, you've sent money to your mum. Uh, so there's that kind of common knowledge that is generated, I think is important, because I can go to the agent. It's not the agent says, oh, by the way, your mum sent your money. I go to the agent and say, my mum sent me money. <laughs> <laughs> this is how much it is. I guess my question was, um, is there government <coughs> employees, because I know in Liberia and other countries, they're experimenting in trying to pay the teachers sure. no, with, no. That, with mobile money, so that they don't often the problem was what the bank reported and the World Development Report was that teachers often had to leave their job, no. travel a couple of days into the city, go to a bank, come back, and then that. But again, that. That's not about mobile money, that's about the Asian network. The reason they have to travel to the city is because that's where the bank is. If they put a bank in the village, then they wouldn't. Because that's, that's what the mobile money agent is. That's a, a source of the cash. So, but, uh, yeah, obviously that would be good. Okay, so we had, actually, I'm going to go to outside seat out people first. Cause yeah. we'll turn that towards Thank you. Uh, could you comment on um, how this filters into macro level statistics? Um, is there an ability to take consumption impacts and reflect in macro level statistics where the money is going and, and how that money is redirecting itself because people have the ability to send it through. So first of all, from a, I'm getting on thin ice here talking about macro, right? uh, but from a monetary perspective, the money you give to the agent gets put into, into the banking system. So one thing is that the money that might have before been, you know, in a under the bed or something like that is now in the banking system, so there might be a change in, in the velocity of money or something like that. Now, some colleagues at uh, 
at Oxford. Uh, they have tried to measure this in Uganda, looking at the impact on the velocity of money and things. You know, this work by uh, Neil Bauer, uh, and they find nothing. Right? They don't see anything there. I'm not surprised. You, know, you read uh, reports that you know, half of Kenya's GDP is going through the mobile money. That's, that's a meaningless statement. I mean, it's, there is meaning to it, but it's not what it seems. It's not like half of GDP. If we got rid of mobile money, we'd lose half of GDP. Right? So I, I don't think things are big enough yet to have serious macroeconomic impact on the monetary side. Um, and also, you know, when you make when you take an extremely poor person and make them not extremely poor, <laughs> that could be like 20 cents, right, a day. 100,000 people, 20,000 bucks, whatever that is, I can't I'm not good numbers. Uh, but that's not going to have big, that's not going to show up at this point. Because remember, it's not, it's not doing anything to rich people. It's changing poor people. I, I doubt we'll see big, big uh, macro. Okay, so we have a question from the lady here. I have a question about the consumption done by those female head uh, households. I just wonder, are there any features or design of um, MPESA that can identify that those women, they have the real control of power over the consumption, like how much to spend on what? Because um, in some African countries and South Asia countries, we know that the male, for example, like the women, they have the micro rooms, but the male in the household, they actually decide like what to buy. Like, so they spend the money of a wine cigarette, like that. Thank you. Um, so we don't have data on that. Yeah, I can't tell you that the man decides or the woman decides. Yeah, female-headed households, most female households don't have a man. <laughs> of, you know, there's not many kind of liberated households in which the wife is telling the husband what to do. Uh, the husband might be part of the extended household in some sense, like off in Nairobi, whatever. Uh, but the, when we look at female headed households, there's a house there and, or a compound or something with a woman in charge. And so the idea that MPESA allows her to make decisions when otherwise the man might have, it's not clear that's going to happen because the man's not there. Now, maybe the man, if the man's sending money home somehow and that he has some control over it that he doesn't when it's on in pessimist, but I can't really tell. We can't tell. I think my other, well, I have a related question, I'm really sorry, but in, in, the, in the male headed household, are you able to capture any gender effects? For example, are there male headed households where you're, you're studying female users and male users, and then is the gender effect hold in those contexts, or is it just a female headed household? Um, so our employment effects, about women, like women, women. Our poverty effects are about big male-headed households. And so women in male-headed households, I, I need to check this, I think they, there's a, there's a coefficient there that says they're more likely to be in business of some kind. Really, is it possible that you're measuring effects only on female-headed households because their economy is simpler? They just have less... Well, uh, well, we're only seeing a poverty reduction on female-headed households. So the question is, what's making female-headed households different from male-headed households <coughs> to actually be able to benefit from this? Or is it an issue of data? I, um, from a traditional standpoint, is a female-headed household that has a long-term for a long time? Exactly. How is that defined, and how might one expect the model of future household decision making and economic activities to? Right. So I, I think. So let me not quite answer those questions, but let me. Maybe I could be a politician. Let me have it away. No. May, may, so one issue for me is okay. The female head of household seem to the poor ones seem to think might have been better off. Is that because their absent husbands can send the money out, right? Or is it because it's not all that because we know that women are doing different things because associated with their So there's a change in labor, but there might be that 
these female-headed households, maybe half of these female-headed households have a husband somewhere else and half of them have their husband died. And if the half that have the husband somewhere else are the ones that are seeing zero effect. Is that data? No. It's self-reported. The, the, they they self-identify as being female-headed or not, and we don't know, I don't think we know enough. We don't. I think we don't. I, I bet you're right, I need to check it. So, a, a couple more questions because we're running out of time. Well, Desi, is there anything else from the phone? Um, I think most of them have been answered already. Javier, you had your hand up? Yeah, just a small comment based on, on the previous discussion around proximity. So, it, it, it seems like what's important is not only proximity, but also access to a savings account, which MPESA provides, and a revision service, which MPESA provides. But it's not the actual use of the phone, right? It's what's, in, what's present in the data where you establish linkages to specific effects is the ability to save and the ability to move money, right? So whether that happens on the mobile or whether it's a bank with an agent that does remittances, you know, it could be perfectly possible. Mm -hmm. That's the implication. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, but it was not measured. Yeah, it was not measured whether it was in PESA or what was providing those services. But as long as the access point provides those two things, then you see those two effects. And you're not discriminating, you know, if somebody was better off after a shock, you're not discriminating whether that was because they received money or whether they saved money. It's those, both, both of those services were present. So it might be, it might be some combination. Sure. Um, do you think that the... So I agree entirely, and this comes back to the public. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they won't do it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I do think, coming back to the other issue, that the phone does provide this verification that allows this to all happen very smoothly. So, yes, if this is a bank and there's a good trade to transfer money from my bank account to my mum's, then that's all fine. She's, I still have to call her and tell her it's there. Uh, she still has to. You know, there's, that phone call is not a verifiable piece of information that she can take to the bank. She has to believe the bank when the bank says, this is much, what's in your account status. So I think there might be a little bit of value. Not, not it's, a, it's a valid inference to say that it, it's, it's a good hypothesis to make, though. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not because of it, it's a Nokia versus a Motorola. Uh, you know, the actual thing doesn't matter. The service, as you point out, is this bundle of financial services, it's savings, remittances, et cetera, that you get access to by being close to financial. In a related question, actually, is there any possibility that the data is being affected by the introduction of the MSHWARI, right? So you, you, you show a shift from agriculture to trade, basically. And, and it doesn't sound like you guys controlled for this, but is, is it possible that there is noise in this because of M. Schwart, where people do have access to credit, albeit very short-term and very expensive credit? Um, but, you know, what other studies have shown that that credit is often used to buy stuff in the morning sure. and sell it and pay it off, right? Yep. So, no, uh, so yeah, it's not just savings and remittances. Maybe it's credit as well. Yep. They, they have access to all of these things now, and, and we don't know which one is, is, is moving the needle. On well, that, uh, the kernel of, of your finding, which I think is very robust, is this idea that we don't know what, what type of service, remittance, uh, credit, I'm sure, whatever. So what we know is that if they are near, they probably will do better. And, and that's very powerful. Okay, so I'm going to go Kate and David, and then we're going to call time. Oh, is there, okay. oh, is there someone from outside? I can wait. Let's go to the next step. So, okay, you identified some insights primarily based on geographic density, then it's the next step to, and also at a household level, so is it then to look at individual level impacts, is it to separate out agent network, OTC model type transactions from mobile phone based uh, provider customer relationships and analyze those impacts, what's the or is it just way from payments to the different types of financial services credit? I, I think I'd be more interested in the next step, like this is a really basic financial service, and one that all of us have taken for granted, taken for granted but the ability to give someone else money. Um, and so when we think of financial services, it's always the next step up. So I would be inclined to ask, you know, can we provide people with meaningful and slightly more sophisticated financial services? They're doing it with them, uh, really expensive. 
terms of such employment. So, um, yeah, uh, I would. There might be some, you know, equilibrium effects. If you provide these formal financial services, then these networks, you know, break down a little bit. Maybe we need to be worried about that. Uh, I, I, and I, I don't know about the mechanics. I'm not going to go with Kate and David, and then we're going to wrap up. So, Kate. Okay. Great presentation, and I liked your question about microcredit, that set of impact studies. I'm thinking of another set of impact studies, which is the graduation findings, more multi-sectoral intervention. And I'm thinking about that's kind of a, a big push, and where we, we see that financial inclusion is important, particularly for the sustained effects, so the financial assets and the productive assets, and saving is part of it. This is really challenging, those findings, because it's a very, a much more incremental. Like you get the savings of it, and you get some of the, the um, you know, shift of the composition of income effects. Do you have any thoughts? These are, you know, somewhat different populations, but it, it certainly challenges a more complex intervention that has very robust impact on it. Yeah. Um, so I think if the, the graduation work is being about you know, addressing a poverty trap type of thing, yeah. so you've got to give enough to people to get them out, and then they'll stay out. But are people kind of saving and so, diversifying their way out of a poverty trap with your lower income? Yeah, there, there's no way for us to identify that there's any kind of threshold effect going on here. That get, you know, once they get in place, they're able to save enough to climb out, and then they're out. We can't do that. Um, and the income levels might be like quite different from what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I can tell. Um, I, I wouldn't, we, we don't want to say, oh, let's just do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm looking at global so, money and poverty, mm -hmm. that's partly why I asked the question. Because <laughs> we asked kid graduation and poverty. Oh, I didn't know that's what I was trying to talk about. That was yeah, the thing, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs>